You know, sometimes I think that this remembrance, or I should say this reflection on the things that are happening. Oh, can you hear that? You hear that extra noise in the background? That's my dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, I actually have one. I'm not doing it by hand. But um, just ignore the noise because that's part of the reality of what everyday life should be like. Because, you know, it's easy to go to church and have this super prepared, you know, sermon or talk or vignette or Bible teaching, expository study, supposedly, <laughs> um, whatever you want to call it, expositional. Um, here, we just reflect on what we're doing with God and with life and emotionally, spiritually, physically, whatever is going on. I record these in video specifically for myself, but then alternately also to allow others to participate in it in that if it fits like a shoe, your foot, then use it. If not, don't confuse it as being specifically for you. It's not. It's for me. So, I wanted to get that off my chest, <laughs> whatever there is of my chest, because today we're going to talk about some things that are personal to me, and we're using the realization that Moses had when he was walking on holy ground, dealing with God Almighty direct, and he said regularly, or he said repeatedly over and over and over again, you know, who are you? What are you? What's your name? Hey, give me your name. What's your name? What's your, you know, on and on. Because he wanted a name because the gods of Egypt had names and everybody had a name. God never gave him a name. I mean, people like to try to say, Yahweh or Yahweh or YHVH or Yehovah or Jehovah and you know all these different combinations of the basic premise that God said I am that I am which also in Hebrew translates I will be what I will be in other words he is extant that he is extant he exists that he exists there's no name for God specifically now Jesus there's a name above all other names and Jesus is the Son of God and God. But in reality, the Father, as Jesus called him, is not his name. Neither is J-H-V-H or Y-H-V-H or however consonants, vowels, or Hebrew letters you want to use. Yud, He, Vav, He, you know, any of those. No. He was telling Moses, you don't get it. You couldn't understand it if I even had a name. So why do you bother with trying to figure it out? Because I am that I am. I just am. This is me. You'll get used to it. You'll never understand me. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, your ways. I'm so far above the heavens that you know you couldn't even begin to conceive them. I mean, if he holds the universe in the span of his hand, I mean, come on now. How tiny are we? Tinier than an ant. Tinier than an atom. So, bottom line is, we want to discuss that in some ways because that's how I feel a lot of times in my own life because... So many people presume, assume, and take presumptuous liberties on either attacking my family, me, my friends, my God, my relationship, the Lord, Jesus, any number of things that I may have touched, be involved in, or somehow am relating to. You know, because, frankly, I'm amazed at how God chose me from the very beginning, you know, and selected me out of nowhere, because even God said later on when I was, I mean, I was very adamant about it. It's like, okay, what, what is this thing, salvation? Why, what, is, what am I? Am I a Christian? Am I a Jew? What am I? You know, and God literally took me in a dream one time, one night, you know, to finally solve a lot of it. And he showed me this long, you know, kind of like vista of people's faces, you know, kind of like generation after generation before me. And he said, this ends here. And he put his finger down and touched me, you know, in the dream. And what it was was that there was like a curse upon my family and generations that ended with me. And that was, whether it be bitterness or whatever, it doesn't matter what it exactly it is, but that God ended it by saving me. And then he worked outward from that moment on to save my generations, my relationships, you know, my relations and related people that are all ex 
extending outward from me. And he did it in spite of me, despite me, without me even involved in it. I mean, with my immediate family, yeah, I got involved pretty quick, but I didn't cause them to get saved. I mean, God did it, because they didn't want to have nothing to do with me, and I, you know, witnessed to them. I did all the stupid things that people say, oh, well, you, you do this, and you get them saved. No, you won't. <laughs> God will save whom he will save, and he will condemn whom he will condemn. He is that he is, and that's all he is. Bottom line, he's in, he's in control, he's in charge. So, when he saved me, I knew that my life might be a little different than everybody else's. And when Crohn's disease hit right after I got saved, wow, was there a difference. Because I'm disabled. And if I have any ability, if I have any strength, if I have any confirmation of capabilities to do anything, which I do a lot, I mean, amazing, is that I'm a miraculous version of a person who had a major disease that should have killed them and was told he would die before 30. And yet I live. So, one of the things that I find interesting is that people, in general, have this attitude and this perspective. We have about nine more minutes, so I just had to double check. That's why I always put the glass on. I can't see, you know, the camera. So, I find it interesting because on the one hand, you know, I go, well, I am glad that God sees all, knows all, does all, and plans all. Because then I can't get away with it. You know, because anytime I start to think about doing something, like, say, beating somebody up because they pissed me off, you know, I've lived long enough that I went, you know, you know, when I get mad at people even, God comes back at me, and I receive the fruit of my labor. I receive back what I was mad about. Not as bad as if I killed the guy or you know beat the guy up or whatever, but as physically fit now as I am, as strong as I am, as, a, as capable as I am, I'm not real worried about somebody coming at me because, frankly, between the Lord and I, you know, I'd probably kill him, you know, because there's a lot of things that, you know, you learn along the way. But do I? <laughs> because, you see, afterwards, what would happen? Sooner or later, it would come back on me, either the blood or the consequences or the responsibility or the family or whatever it may be. And that happens in every little detail of my life, and dare I say, you're going to find out the hard way, your life. Any little thing, you cheat on your taxes, you do anything, and it comes back. It's the opposite extreme. I am so glad that God sees because when I ask Him for something, I get it. I mean, literally, I get it. Right now, today, I have to clean, you know, like the back room because I have a whole house of carpeting free. Did you hear me? Free. Can I repeat that? Free. Now, so many things in my life has always been, if I go out and buy it, really, it doesn't seem to last. But if God provides it, whoa, it's so much more than what I ever imagined I needed or wanted or could use. And that's what's amazing about my life as a witness, as a perspective, as a testimony, is that, wow, look at what God does. And at the same time, look at what God does. Meaning that when I'm good, I get, you know, blessed in a lot of things, and I get, you know, I ask Him for things, and I let Him do it, and He handles it. It's kind of like defense. You know, it's like people tend to get really mad when I post things or I record videos or whatever it may be, because they're mad at God, and they're mad at themselves for not being easier to find God and to get to God and to know God. Because if they did, they'd be like, ha, I'm thrilled to be here. And yet, when I watch what happens to people that, if I leave it alone, if I back off and say, God, go get them. You know, I, I don't even pray much. I say, well, God, save them if you're going to save them. You know, get them if you're going to get them, but protect me and get you know them out of the situation. And he does. I mean, I don't get exactly what I want, you know, like I might say, oh, kill them, and you no, know, God doesn't really do things like that. I mean, you could say about with terrorism or something, you know, that you want to have some revenge or something. It doesn't work that way. But if you let God be your defense, you don't need to take offensive action, but if someone offends you, God gets them. He gets them. I mean, he gets them. I mean, he, he grabs them by the scuff of their neck, you know, and drags them off. Now, if they're a Christian, it might take a little longer because he kind of works it out. But the bottom line is that 
if they're not saved, oh yeah, he, he grabs them and he works on them to get them saved, but he uses that circumstance that maybe you were the one that was the catalyst, you caused them, you provoked them, you know, just by being you. You are that you are. I mean, if you're saved or if you're following Jesus, then you, of course, are salt, you're light. You're going to cause people to be mad at you unreasonably, irrationally, and rationally, even if you make a mistake, even if you sin, even if you do something against someone. God will still use it. Because all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That simply means that, no, it's not all good. You're still going to get busted by God. But you're not going to get busted necessarily by the person that's coming at you because God wants to use it for his reasoning. Now, God may use a police officer to enforce the law on you if you broke the law. He may use disease or, or other things, you know, if, say, you're you know, not doing what he wants you to and he needs to force you into a certain circumstance or perspective or go someplace or do something. I mean, it's a lot easier to just ask him and then go there rather than be forced there by health or wealth or prosperity or poverty or whatever it may be that he uses to force you to do something. I recently had an instance where I, you know, I was dealing with some guy, you know, and, you know, he tried to provoke me by using all these different, you know, statements and I laughed because it's like, man, I've been saved for over 40 years and even among people that are saved, I was a challenge because it was like, well, I don't know why, you know, I don't do this, but it's because God told me not to do that, so I don't do that. Or, I do this, and they're like, but God doesn't tell me. I'm like, well, go ask him. Or ask him about me. You know, if he tells you I'm wrong, then come back and tell me. You know, I've been telling people that for 40 years. They still don't come back and tell me. One did once, you know, and I kind of went back to God and asked him. I said, well, God, is that true? And God said, leave it to me. You know, and then the guy came back later on and apologized. You know, it's kind of... I mean, I'm not saying I'm righteous, by far, no. I'm a sinner like you. you know, I commit things, do things, and have problems with things just like you do. You know, But when I reflect on, in my older age, looking at some of the stupid things that people do, kind of like with the vaccines, you know, how can you be an anti-vaxxer? I mean, it's just, the Bible is very clear. You know, you look at the pole with the snake on it and you live, and yet, my people, the children of Israel, Jews, would not look at the pole. A whole thousands of them died in a day because they would not look. They said, no, we're not going to do it. We don't believe that. We don't believe, we don't accept it. No, 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 no. I'm not going to look at the pole. Nope. I refuse. Not going to look. No way. Not me, man. Uh-uh. And they died. And all they had to do was look. This isn't a, you know, fake story. This is a real life circumstance. Snakes had bitten everyone in the camp, you know, and they had to be, in order to be saved, they had to look at the pole. Now, later on, we're told that it's look at Jesus, you know, and stuff like that, but the point being is that it's still true today. The same story works. COVID-19, what do you need to get vaccinated? Nothing. You can have it free. That obviously is God. God's grace is shed upon America. So God's grace, whenever it's extended through America, should be free and no strings attached. There aren't any. You could be vaccinated. You could be safe. You could be protected. And yet, what are people saying? What are people doing? They are refusing to be vaccinated for their own stupidity because they make up, they make up reasons, they make up excuses that have no validity in the scriptures, that have nothing to do with God, and have nothing to do with Christianity, much less Judaism. So, if you ever see people that are out there, you know, that you maybe you're following God, doing the best you can, you know, and then they come back and try to tell you to do something else. Hey, ignore them. Leave it alone. Walk away. God will get them. I always said that, you know, it's like my sisters and my family used to say, don't let Michael pray for you. Oh, man, if he starts praying for you, all hell will break loose. If you weren't saved, yeah, it's true. And, you know, my sister died with that on her lips. I mean, she's saved, but she told everybody that even right before she died. I remember we were talking about that and laughing about that. So, I got news for you. If you trust the Lord, if you commit your way unto Him, if you let God do it, God will take care of it. If you try to do it, you will fail miserably and you'll learn that you can't do it of your own and you can't do it with God, but God can do it for you.
Let God and let God be God because He is that He is.